Okay, we're gonna get started. Uh, it's uh, noon uh, in Miami and Boston and New York. Uh, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for our international audience. And on behalf of the organizing committee, it's a pleasure again to welcome you to the Frailty Seminar Series. Today, we have a great panel with distinguished speakers whom I'll introduce soon. And they'll be talking about frailty indexes based on electronic health record data. And they'll talk about interesting research on the development of frailty index following parallel developments in frailty conceptualizations, the deficit accumulation, as well as clinical informatics and the uh, rapid adoption of electronic health records uh, in most uh, high income uh, countries. So, uh, during this panel, again, I'll, I'll introduce this distinguished group of speakers who will talk about uh, the topic. He'll, each speaker will uh, speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, at the end of the three presentations, we will have time for questions. So please, if you have any questions, uh, you know, keep them to the end. Uh, you can use the green, the button uh, for Q&A that is in the lower part of your screen. Uh, please do not use the chat unless you want to communicate with each other or, 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 or send a message to, to the speakers maybe later, but for questions, please use the Q&A. Remember to complete the post webinar surveys. They will go in an email to you uh, and a link at the end of this presentation. Your responses will be highly appreciated and it will help us improve the quality of these uh, seminars. So I'm gonna introduce the three speakers now. Uh, first, Dr. Andrew Clegg with University of Leeds in United Kingdom. Dr. Clegg is a professor of geriatric medicine at the University of Leeds, honorary consultant geriatrician at Bradford Royal Infirmary and associate director for health data research, UK North. Uh, Andy leads a large portfolio of aging and frailty research, including leadership of a research theme focused on improving care for older adults with frailty. His research expertise spans clinical trials of interventions, prognostic modeling using routine data, applied epidemiology, and evidence synthesis. His PI for the personalized care planning for older people with frailty, PROSPER, the home-based exercise for all the people, HERO trial, and the community aging research 75 plus study. A longitudinal aging and frailty cohort study designed using trial within cohort methods. So Andy previously led the development and validation and national implementation of the multi-award winning and nice recommended electronic Frailty Index, we will be talking about that today, using data from about around 1 billion patients in the United Kingdom containing clinical and research databases with a major impact on UK health policy. Next is Dr. Ariela Orcavi. She's from Harper Medical School and the New England Greg in Boston, United States. She's a geriatrician with training in preventive cardiology and epidemiology. She's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and investigator at the VA New England Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center. Her clinical research, and research work focuses on the intersection of frailty, cardiovascular disease, and healthy aging. She has used frailty as a predictor for clinical and preclinical cardiovascular disease, examining the role of common medications for frailty and cardiovascular disease prevention in older adults, and has defined frailty in diverse settings, including existing research data sets and electronic health records. She has been instrumental in the development and evaluation of the Veterans Affairs Frailty Index, BAFI, and Electronic Frailty Index. She currently serves as a principal investigator on both BA and NIH funded grants related to statins and the role in cardiovascular disease and frailty prevention. Last but not least, Dr. Nicholas Pajewski, from Wake Forest University Health Sciences in North Carolina, United States. Nick is an associate professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Data Science at Wake Forest School of Medicine, where he's also the director of statistical analytics for the Center for Healthcare Innovation. Dr. Pajewski is a biostatistician and clinical trialist with experience in several multi-site randomized trials in older adults, including the systolic blood pressure intervention trial SPRINT, and the National Institute of Aging NIA funded pragmatic evaluation of events and benefits 
of lipid lowering in older adults preventable trial. He's an assistant editor for biostatistics for the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and is a member of the National Institute of Aging Impact Collaboratory. Dr. Pajewski has worked on several applications of the deficit accumulation model of frailty. He has implemented an electronic frailty index integrated within the electronic health record at Wake Forest, which is currently being tested as part of pharmacological management strategies for patients with diabetes, preoperative care pathways, and care outreach strategies using community health care workers. So thank you for our speakers to participate in this panel today. And Dr. Clegg will start the panel. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, Jorge. And you just also met my daughter. Oh. She just came into shot. So uh, really delighted to be here and really real pleasure to talk about um, this really important topic um, and fantastic to uh, be one of the one of the speakers today so I'll, I'll just share my screen uh, moment, hopefully this will work can you can you all can you see that yes yes so today I was going to talk about um, my experience is leading this project to develop and then uh, implement nationally uh, an electronic frailty index using routine uh, primary care electronic health record data. So I'm, I'm going to give a view from the English National Health Service. I thought I'd just start with a couple of slides just to orientate people to the context in which, which I work, just to explain the way that the English National Health Service is, is organised. So most many of you will know this, but some of you might not. So the United Kingdom is made up of four countries, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. England has a population of about 55 million people, Scotland about 5 million, Wales about 3 million, Northern Ireland about 2 million people. Uh, but each of the countries has its own devolved healthcare system. It makes its own decisions about healthcare. Um, so although they, they're, they're quite closely aligned, really, they're, they're all under the umbrella of the National Health Service many of the priorities are, are the same or very similar. There are some differences between the systems and because they make their own decisions and have their own funding and that they commission healthcare services from, they, they are organised slightly separately. So I'm going to focus on the English National Health Service because this is the one that's most relevant to the work that we've done. And then again, just to explain the way that funding flows through the English national healthcare system. So it's a socially funded system of healthcare that's funded through general taxation. Um, and quite a centralised system, really, in terms of the way that the funding flows. So the Department of Health and Social Care is our UK government ministerial department that receives about £130 billion pounds of money uh, from the UK Treasury, about 10% of uh, UK GDP. Um, about uh, just over £100 billion of that is then passed on to NHS England, who are the main organisation responsible really for the commissioning uh, of healthcare services for the uh, population of England. Um, about £30 billion goes to general practice, dentistry, pharmacy and specialised services, and about £84 billion to clinical commissioning groups that could commission um, urgent emergency care, elective care, uh, mental health services, and so on. Um, social care services are commissioned separately. About £20 billion goes, goes to local authorities um, who commission social care services for the population that they, that they serve. So that's just to give you an idea about how, uh, how the money flows through the healthcare system in, in England. Um, and this is quite important, I think. It's just the way that um, care is organised uh, and delivered in the English national healthcare system and in, well in the national health um, system as a whole. Um, so primary care is the absolute bedrock of the national health service in this country. Uh, it's mainly delivered through general practitioners, what many of you would call family doctors, and they act as gatekeepers to secondary care services. And the vast majority of patient contacts within the NHS occurs in primary care. And importantly, every single general practice in uh, the UK, uh, England within the UK, have had an established electronic medical record in place, most of them since the mid 1990s actually. Uh, and there are only four system suppliers of primary care electronic health record systems in the UK. And the other thing that's, that's relevant really is that geriatric medicine is a big specialty in the UK. So we have quite a big voice. Um, 
in terms of uh, national policy. And we have a very well established national clinical director for older people and in integrated care who sits within NHS England as, the, as this uh, organisation that commissions uh, services. So that's how things are set up in the UK. So it's quite important in terms of the EFI work that we've been doing. So I'll just take you through the work that we've done to develop, validate, and then implement our electronic frailty index, but then also move on to the, uh, the work that we've done around national policy. Um, so, ooh, sorry, I've got a visit from my daughter again, who's asking me a question. Yep. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so uh, I'll take you through the EFI work, the development and validation. So we used Ken Rockwood's very well established cumulative deficit model of frailty, worked with two very large research data sets, in total about one million patient records. And we worked with um, the research one data set, development and then internal validation cohort. And we worked with the UK primary care coding system, which it uses um, a version of coding called read coding. It, it's now um, uh, it's now been upgraded to SNOMED CT coding that most of you, more of you will be familiar with, but a very large number of codes that we searched through and organized into, we used about 2000 of these codes and organized them into 36 um, deficits aligned with the cumulative deficit model. Um, and this was based entirely on um, existing information in the, in the primary care record. We then used the same database, but a separate data set for the internal validation, looking at outcomes of care, home admission, hospitalisation and mortality. And we did the same again, uh, ran the external validation in, in a separate data set, the, th the thin data set in the UK. And all this is published in our uh, paper from back in 2016. These are our 36 deficits. Some of you will be familiar with uh, the actual deficits in our model. But they span the clinical signs, symptoms, diseases, disabilities and impairments that you'd largely expect to see in a cumulative deficit model, although they are probably more dominated by the by the diagnostic disease codes, I suppose, the, the, the disease based codes that we'd use, but, but does extend into symptoms, dizziness, uh, breathlessness, um, clinical impairments and disabilities, so things like activity limitation, mobility problems, transfer problems, um, requirement for care. And then we use this to create a very simple EFI score, just the number of deficits that are identified in the health record divided by the total possible. And that was quite a big advantage when it came to the imp implementation, having quite a simple EFI model made it much more straightforward when we came to the implementation in the primary care uh, systems. These are some of the outcomes. These are age and sex adjusted outcomes, looking at care home admission, hospitalisation, mortality. We created frailty categories, mild, moderate, severe frailty. And as you can see, for people with mild, moderate and severe frailty, if we take these outcomes, people are at one year, people are largely at around about a twofold, threefold and four to sixfold increased um, risk of experiencing those outcomes at, at three years. Um, and the results in the internal and external validation all aligned uh, pretty closely, actually, which gave us confidence in the in the model. Um, the discrimination estimates, the statistic estimates were between 0.7 and 0.75. So not bad, actually, pretty, pretty reasonable for um, for this sort of model, for these sorts of outcomes. This is the same information presented slightly differently, just using survival curves. And so you can see very simply, graphically, that the uh, trajectories diverge for people who we identify as fit and with mild, moderate and severe frailty. And these are the prevalence estimates for those different categories. But it's quite useful because you can use, the, um, use this way of presenting the data to also start to see how we link the EFI to the sorts of interventions that you might be thinking about when you start to look at developing population health management systems for people living with different degrees of, of frailty. And this is how we then move forward in terms of the implementation and linking through to uh, national policy developments. I suppose this is that same information presented in a, I suppose in a population health management model that people will be more familiar with. So population health management at its heart is, is based about identifying different subgroups of people who are largely at different risk of experiencing different outcomes and linking those different groups to different interventions 
as far as possible evidence-based interventions. Um, so this presents some of the evidence base that we've got for the sorts of interventions that we'd be thinking about for people living with different levels of frailty. And then on the right, I've put what we think about as impactable patients. So thinking about the sorts of interventions that, that might span more than one of these different frailty categories around falls prevention, medicines optimization, community-based rehabilitation, those sorts of things. It's just thinking about how we translate the evidence into population health management frameworks and link them through to uh, uh, models like the EFI. The national implementation was the big step. So as I mentioned, in the UK, we have four suppliers of electronic health record systems in primary care. TPP, who we worked with very closely as part of this work, they supply around about 40% of uh, UK general, general practices with an electronic medical record. Emis Health, who supply about 50%, uh, Vision, who supply between 8 and 9% of practices, and Microtest, who supply a very small proportion, just 1% uh, of practices. But we, within, the, within about 12 months or so, we got from the stage of the um, validation work through to implementation in each of these electronic health record systems. So in, in about 12 months, we made the EFI freely available to basically to every single general practice in England and about 95% of all UK practices. Um, we supply it for free, we don't look to make um, profit out of it on the basis that these suppliers of systems don't then try and generate profit from the people that are using it. Um, we also got support for the EFI as part of the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence multimorbidity guidelines, just adding that additional credibility to the work and have won various awards. Uh, including through the Royal College of Physicians, which again just adds that, adds that credibility. And again, this was a, well, a huge step forward. Um, when, once we'd made the EFI available across all of the primary care electronic he uh, health record systems in the UK, in England specifically, uh, we were then able to move forward with a big contractual change. So basically, uh, what, I'm, what I put on this slide um, is part of the general practice contract so a national contract for all general practitioners in the UK to begin identifying and managing people living with frailty so specifying using our EFI as the starting point um, and then moving on to a, a clinical review providing things like medication review um, falls assessment falls management and other things trying to um, trying to get um, summary care records, which then make some of this information available in secondary care. So this was a big step, a big contractual change, making frailty identification and management uh, mandatory as part of a general practice. And in the, in the first month, 12 months after the contract change, about over 1 million uh, people, older people in the UK were assessed, uh, in England were assessed for the presence of frailty. And I think it was around 200,000 were then refer, either referred on to false prevention services or re received a, a medications uh, management um, review in primary care. So linking through to, uh, to, to interventions that, that we'd be thinking about for people with, with frailty. These were some of the key facilitators uh, for this national policy change. We did a lot of work to try and establish a common language for frailty that was more closely aligned with the language of clinical practice and health policy, not the language of research. As I mentioned, um, the infrastructure available in the UK, the establishment of primary care electronic medical record use with a small number of system suppliers was a key facilitator. And also that we have this national clinical director for older people and integrated care. Um, and then a big lever was including frailty identification and management uh, as part of our national re contract requirement in, in primary care. I mean it has been a huge step forward but it's also been a big step in terms of um, new research because having this infrastructure means that we're able to now move on to um, uh, identifying um, populations for clinical trials of new interventions and once we have the evidence from those interventions we can then link back the findings uh, back into implementation uh, into routine practice so this is I mean it's helped hugely there's been a lot of other things that I could talk about as part of the work but I thought I'd focus on these uh, elements first and then some of this might come out in the discussion so I think that's an, an overview for me um, and look forward to the further discussion uh, in the uh, later uh, session and we'll look forward to hearing the other talks from the other presenters as well 
So thanks for listening. Happy to take any questions at the uh, later stages. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Ariella. All right, can you see this? Yes. Okay, hopefully the slides are loading. There we are. All right, well, thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you, uh, Professor Clyde, for taking us through the tremendous work that you've done in the UK to advance frailty work. We're quite a bit uh, behind you here in the United States. And I'll be talking about what we've done at the VA um, to, oops, let's see if I can, take this forward to develop our VAFI and how we're using it for research and what we hope to do to eventually integrate the VAFI into clinical care. So by way of introduction for those who are not familiar with the VA, the Veterans Health Administration serves all uh, U.S. veterans across the country and is the largest integrated healthcare network in the United States. And it serves about 9 million enrollees with over 6 million active patients and and if you look back across the VA, all time patients amount to over 24 million individuals who've been cared for here. And VA has used the uh, same electronic health record since the 1980s, which really creates just a tremendous amount of rich data um, that is almost unparalleled anywhere in the world, except perhaps um, in the UK. And so the VAHR, EHR record, uh, records are all um, come together in what's called the Corporate Data Warehouse, which receives data inputs from around the nation in order to put together all of the lab records, the pharmaceutical information, um, registry data, research information, and so forth. Um, I'll put this forward here. And all of this can be uh, found in a single CDW um, in, in files that can be accessed by analysts who are who can run any sorts of queries on VA information. But of course, the United States is not a single healthcare system and veterans are welcome to go outside VA and can have care for you know, regular routine visits or emergency healthcare. And they, that data for anybody 65 and older is captured in Medicare and Medicaid information. And so when we combine all of this data, we can really get a fin almost a complete picture of healthcare utilization for our veterans. And this amounts to some of the richest clinical data. Now, when we set out to do this work beginning in 2015, it was clear, certainly to myself as a geriatrician and to many others, that veterans are older and they're sicker than the civilian population. And it was clear that you know, doing a comprehensive geriatric assessment for every patient is just not possible. And developing an electronic frailty index would be useful for population health and also for individual patient interactions. So looking at the decade from 2002 to 2012, there were about 3 million veterans who were over 65 and older who were regular users of VA care. And what we did not know at the time were how many were frail and were there regional differences across the US in the VA healthcare system. And we had many different data sources we could use. We could use the actual clinical record. We could use that corporate data warehouse, which captures all of those administrative claims data and other EHR information. And we also had access to Medicare and Medicaid information, all those claims, again, outside VA. We used the standard procedure established by Searle and colleagues based on the Rockwood Frailty Index in order to develop our Frailty Index, which I won't detail all the details here, but can be found in our publications. And we really did this with geriatrician input to make it a CGA-based FI that could be calculated electronically. And we covered domains that included morbidity, cognition and mood, function using durable medical equipment use, sensory impairment, and other things like failure to thrive and weight loss that we could capture from the records. We settled on a 31-item VA FI that uses claims from VA and augmented all of that with our Medicare and Medicaid data. So when we looked in 2002, about 30% of 1.6 million veterans who were regulars, regular users of VA were frail. And that number increased by 50%. So that by 2012, 45% of almost 2 million veterans seen in VA were identified as frail. Now we use the cutoff of 0.2 for frailty 
um, or mild frailty, 0.3 for moderate frailty, and 0.4 for severely frail. And we could debate which exact cutoff is right, and I'll show you some data later um, about why we settled on 0.2, uh, but it certainly made this data comparable to, to other studies that had been done. And we looked at geographic variation of frailty across VA. In 2002, there certainly were differences, but over time, the prevalence of frailty has really varied across the nation and has increased over time, such that the southern part of the country um, is really where the highest prevalence and burden of frailty sits. In 2015, the US transitioned to ICD-10, so this required us to update the VAFI. And at the time, our ICD-9-based VAFI included about 714 codes that went into those 31 variables. And with the ICD-10, there was just an explosion. We ended up identifying over 5,600 codes uh, that met those same 31 variables. And we had to go through these by hand because there were things that just didn't map properly and there were other variables that were left out. Um, just as an example, under falls, there were pediatric falls that were captured in ICD-10. And if we didn't clean those things out, we would be inappropriately capturing the wrong types of falls uh, for our older patients. Now, what's been interesting is that even though we saw a very big increase in the prevalence of frailty from 2002 to 2012, that sort of leveled off. And we've seen that the prevalence of frailty has, is hovering around 40 to 45%. Now, working with all of these data, there are so many decisions that we've had to make along the way. And one of the big ones was how many years of look back do we need in order to calculate this VAFI? Can we look at one year? Just what are the claims for that for that one year? Do we have to go back two or three years to get more of a steady state? And it turns out that when we look at either three years prior or one year prior, you get a little bit of reclassification to higher frailty in that three-year look back. So here in the pink underneath this green shade is the three-year look back and the green or the blue over here is that one-year look back. And there's a little bit of a difference, but it doesn't really change the prevalence all that much. And the association of mortality remains the same. But what happens if we don't include the, the, the information from outside VA, all that Medicare data that we're enriching our data with? Um, not everybody will have access to that CMS data. It lags. There's often a two to three year period of lag where we don't get that data into VA. So what happens if we don't include it? So this is where we see um, more of a shift in terms of who we're identifying as frail and up to one in four in veterans, uh, uh, one in four veterans will be reclassified to a higher frailty category when we use that Medicare data. But importantly, the association with mortality is maintained. And so this means that on, at least on a population level, when we're using a VAFI for screening, we can use either one. Sure, it's better to use more data when it's available. That's always true, almost always true. But at least here we, we have some evidence that if we can't use Medicare data we don't have access to it, we'll still have a reasonable assessment at, at the population level of who our frail individuals are. So now that we have this tool, there's been just an explosion in terms of research around the nation. Um, this is just looking at two-year risk of mortality from 2012 to 2014. This is a spline, and that gets back to what I said earlier about using that 0.2 cutoff. At that 0.2 mark is where we just saw an exponential rise in the risk of mortality. Um, using the frailty index helps us reset life expectancy estimates. So if you take a man um, who's frail and or this is severely frail and they're 65 years old their median survival time is less than five years but if you take um, a man who's over 85 who is not frail at all their median survival time is more like six and a half years that has tremendous implications when we think about screening for example screening colonoscopy we should be reconsidering who we're offering screening to and we should as I think everybody in this audience knows it's not just about that biologic, that chronologic age, it's about biological age and frailty is helping us to do that. And there is um, a large initiative to integrate frailty into thinking about how we roll out screening for all sorts of things such as cancer. Um, the VAFI is being used again across the nation in lots of different research studies covering lots of different topics, um, both as a predictor and as an outcome everything from the cardiovascular disease world to COVID and other infections, surgery. Recently, I learned about some work being done in elder abuse and social determinants of health space. 
to see how frailty plays a role um, in these individuals. And here are data that we just recently published showing the association between VAFI level and cardiovascular mortality over time. And there, while there is a clear association between higher frailty and increased risk of cardiovascular mortality, that's actually been overall going down over time. So perhaps a sign that we're doing something right in terms of prevention. When we focus in on frailty research specifically, one of the, the things that um, has really been identified as a gap is how do we measure dynamic changes in frailty um, in an individual? And so what we did here was use a birth cohort, about 214,000 veterans born from 1927 to 1934, and looked at their frailty trajectories in the five years before death. And we found all sorts of interesting trajectories. Overall, there were nine different trajectories, including stability, rapid increases, and even recovery, about 9% of the, uh, the cohort had a recovering trajectory. Now, of course, this has to be followed up um, with prospective studies, but gives us a, a nice insight here that frailty really is dynamic, and there are lots of different paths that our patients can take. Another important question is how does the VAFI compare to other frailty um, indices that are electronic frailty indices that are readily available and other risk tools? And so what we did, um, and this is unpublished internal data that I'm sharing for the first time from uh, in collaboration with my colleagues at the GECDAC, the Geriatric and Extended Care Data Center, where we are comparing actively um, multiple different frailty definitions based on different theories, such as the Siegel, which is derived from the free, or Date Kim's Medicare-based frailty index, um, and comparing also to a Charlson or Alex Hauser, um, risk score. And the bottom line here is that each of these different risk scores or frailty tools are all predictive of mortality. And these are ROCs here. They're all doing almost exactly the same, which as a geriatrician and as a frailty researcher makes me feel reassured that whichever tool or EFI you have available to you is the one that you should be using. More to come on that soon. Um, of course, all of this work you know, we don't want to keep it internal or keep it to ourselves. We are actively sharing this work. We've published in all of our papers um, all the claims codes that go into this, and we've now made all of the codes that go into both the ICD-9 and ICD-10 version freely available through the Cypher website at VA, which is accessible um, to non-VA users as well. Now, finally, how are we going to bring this into our clinical world? Well, first, again, let's not let perfection be the enemy of the good. Let's start using frailty um, and learn from what's been done in the UK. And our goal here in VA is to integrate the VAFI into the clinical record as a passive EFI. This requires a partnership between operations and research to bring this to the clinic. We have ongoing pilot programs to see how do we actually, once, once we roll this out, what are we going to do with it? We need education that goes along with that so that our clinicians know what to do with the information. And of course, we want to avoid turning frailism into the new ageism. Um, and with that, I will end and say thank you to the whole team who's been involved here in doing this work. And of course, to our veterans who allow us to care for them every day. Thank you, Riella. Now, Nick. All right, here we go. Um, so thank you very much um, to the organizer of this for the opportunity to um, especially follow the great talks by Andy and Ariella about this. Um, so I thought I'd sort of focus on sort of practical advice from our experience in using these type of tools. And so our context is very different, much less integrated. We forest were a, uh, we were at least a, a six hospital health system. Um, now we've merged sort of with Atrium Health and now grown to be 43 hospitals. Um, and I'll get to a little later the growing pains with that is because we were essentially a system using Epic who is now merged with a system using Cerner. And so that brings a number of data challenges in that. But just to say our context is uh, quite a bit different than both the VA or the um, English NHS. So uh, what I thought I'd go over is sort of the timeline of, you know, from an investigator initiated thing. So this is very much following off Andy's work of 
you know, our experience was saying, hey, we'd like to do that too in our institution. So what does that actually take um, in terms of the IT build, the negotiation with leadership and things like that? Uh, wanted to cover sort of the current applications of the EFI. Where does this tend to work? Where do you need to think about other mechanisms for frailty screening and give you some examples of the projects um, are you, where we're using this, which is very similar to what's um, also described, uh, gives some helpful bits on the technical side. I think there's a lot of think about building the score is just the first step. There's a lot more work after that. And then just a little bit of general advice. So should you want to do something like this yourself uh, within your own um, health system? So our EFI implementation is very similar in some ways and different others compared to what Andy and Ariella described. Um, you know, everything's consistent with sort of the deficit accumulation model, um, but we're not relying solely on diagnosis codes. So we're bringing in lab tests. Um, we have data from the uh, Medicare annual wellness visits, um, which is generally for people in our accountable care organizations, we get that about 75% of the time now, we're doing much better than we did in the past. And so that brings in some functional assessment of cognition and things of the sort. So it's not just diagnosis code based. Um, also looking at medications to try to have a flag for polypharmacy and things of that sort. Uh, the disadvantage is it's totally EHR based. So as Ariella nicely showed, we don't have claims to necessarily fill in from utilization outside of our health system. So it's basically whatever we see internally, that's what we're using, which has its own limitations. Um, but basically our EFI, it has over 50 items. And right now our current implementation within Epic, so it's computed on a weekly basis for all patients 55 and older with a requirement that's important in terms of applications that we had to have two visits in the past two years where someone measured a blood pressure on you. So basically that's sort of our filter for someone saw this person. And so we don't wanna call an absence of information uh, as robust health status. We want to say someone saw this and done some evaluation. So we have this sort of outpatient blood pressure requirement. Um, just to show you, this is sort of what the EFI and EPIC looks like. We spent a lot of work working with IT to actually make it a smart phrase and things like that. So it could be directly pulled in. Um, one of the other points, and it's probably too small to see here, is um, in, through a lot of discussions with clinicians, there was a lot of um, unease about interpreting the number. And so one of the things we do is also present an age and sex adjusted percentile norm to our population, just to give the clinicians some relative sense of you know, what this number may mean. Now, there's pros and cons with that. There's some reasons why you think you may not actually want to do that, um, you know, based on uh, trying to disconnect age, you know, from biological aging, as Ariella described. But we found, generally speaking, this helps the clinicians in terms of interpreting, is this a really high number or is this something lower, which is really what they're trying to do with this from a screening perspective. Um, here's sort of a, a basic timeline just to show you, unfortunately, how long this type of thing is. So my first exposure to Dr. Rockwood's work on deficit accumulation was back sometime in 2015. And within the next two years, we'd had the idea following Andy's publication to do this type of thing and got a pilot grant in 2017 to do that. And you can sort of step through a lot of IT applications. And finally, you know, both in 2019, we both published our first paper describing the approach and actually had it go live within Epic in that year. So we've been live within the HR for about three years now. We've been making modifications as we go along. One of the things like we've switched now to the race-free EGFR equation. So you, when, as you're doing this, you have to think of how you're gonna adapt it. And what we're doing now, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a lot of adaptation for how do you take this and apply it to different data models. So, you know, even within Epic, if you've seen one instance of Epic at a site, you've seen one instance. And so there's a lot of work we're doing now to create a consistent data model that you could port this, you know, from health system to health system without having to reinvent the wheel each time you did it. Um, so thoughts on those timelines. So you can see there, it was, you know, two plus years from sort of an initial idea to actually getting something in the HR. But and even with that, we benefited from a lot of things with making the timeline that short. You know, there was a, the, the model was proved out. There was a lot of research showing this idea works and the value of it. Um, and he had showed that this works and can be done in England. Um, we weren't super concerned with a lot of, we need to very robustly validate this um, first, we thought the model would generally work. And we're also at an institution who has a really strong aging community with both the Pepper Center and ADRC. 
our health system president at the time was an aging researcher, and we had established a new sort of healthcare innovation center that was also led by a geriatrician. So you can see sort of the confluence of factors that made this like the perfect setting where this was actually going to get green lighted to make happen, because um, enough people who are uh, informed on aging were involved at the table. And so I, I think that's part of the way this sped up. Otherwise, it might have even probably taken longer to make happen. Um, some lessons learned about actually applying this. So, you know, as I mentioned with sort of that blood pressure filter, the, our implementation, it really relies on outpatient primary care data. So that, you know, that's really going to work best in populations for which you provide the primary care. Um, it also means it's not going to be available for everyone. So even in our Medicare ACO populations, where these patients are attributed to us, about 15% of the patients aren't going to have enough data within our system to define the EFI. There's just not data there. They only see us for sporadic specialty care, even though they end up being assigned to us. We've also learned we've had a lot of interest in the surgical space from our emergency and trauma surgeons using a tool like this, but unfortunately their populations end up being up to 45 or 50% referrals. So these are patients that we've never really seen before. And so we've had a lot of struggle explaining to them that this really doesn't work. If there's not an EHR record of this person, you can't really use this in, in that context. Um, the other lesson application is, you know, we're using a two-year look back, and so this makes it a very good sort of population risk stratification tool. Um, we've had a lot of people interested in sort of using it to dynamically monitor short-term changes, you know, in response to surgery or a hospitalization, and uh, our experience is it really doesn't work for that. It's not designed to be that type of tool. This is not something that's going to be necessarily that dynamic or responsive because, you, you know, you have a lot of the diagnosis codes like, say, hypertension, which it's still there. It's not going to change, and so the number really doesn't shift based on um, how someone recovers. Um, just to give you a flavor of where we're using this, this is very similar to the type of interventions uh, Andy described. You know, we've used it as sort of a flag to prompt advanced care planning discussions uh, for vulnerable older adults um, in surgery. Um, the thing we're really excited about this is in the bottom left as using it as a deprescribing flag. So we have a pilot now where we've done about 200 people where we have a centralized pharmacy review of folks with low A1Cs who are on insulin or sulfonylurea. And the exciting thing is in about half the cases thus far, we're having medication changes recommend, recommended by the pharmacist and accepted by the PCP. And so we're following these people now to actually see what happens with their glycemic control and things like that. But uh, I think that's the type of intervention where you can see this being used. Um, and then the final thing, we have a recent uh, Duke Endowment funded proposal. We're using this as a flag sort of integrated with social determinants of health screening to prompt outreach by community health workers um, to frail older adults in the community. So that's just getting started now. But this gives you a flavor of, you know, it, we're very much using this as a tool to add resources and target it um, to, you know, the members of our patient pool that we think are at the highest need. Um, on the technical side, you know, I think one of the lessons that we didn't think of up front is uh, you build a tool like this, you actually have to monitor it. So we had an experience early in the year where uh, in underlying EPIC, they changed the lab units on all the liver function tests um, and also changed some other things with labs. And so it basically we had a period where all the lab query didn't work and bombed. And so we've since fixed a lot of this and we have this nice monitoring report now that sure shows how many frail people have, what's the success of processing data. But um, you know, if I had some advice, if you're gonna do this type of thing, do this at the beginning and don't you know, try to do it one year later once you've thrown something out there. Um, some other things is obviously validation of the data elements is critical. We spent a lot of um, many months pulling our hair out trying to get a medications query that we thought was at least believable to try to get a polypharmacy. Um, it turns out that that's a lot harder to do than you would think. Um, other also need to pay attention to data management. Uh, these EHR extracts can get very big very quickly based on the redundancy and all the various things in the system. You know, we're pulling this on about 170,000 patients now. And once we integrate with Atrium, that'll be approaching a million. Um, and so you have to think some things like, do you process every patient every week? Um, eventually we got smarter and right now our current implementation only processes you again if you had a visit that week. And so it voids updating a lot of stuff. 
And then the other thing you should think about is an eye towards maintenance and updating. You know, we, in our initial coding, we have a lot of hard coding of lab limits, particular diagnosis codes, lists, and things like that. And you probably want to build that in a more flexible way because those things will generally get updated over time um, as things change. But uh, as you know, some general thoughts, as Andy said, I, I think these EFIs, the great thing is they're a great way to create a language of frailty. We've had a lot of buy-in from clinicians in cardiology, outside of geriatrics, that here's a number we can all talk about. We can you know, speak about frailty and everybody's on the same page. Um, they're very good, I think, to sort of triage, triage at scale. As Ariel mentioned, you know, we can't do CGA everywhere. And so we have to find a way to get down to who do we need to do CGA in. Um, and they're also a good way, I think, you know, to target interventions like pharmacy re review. Um, Buy-in from the leadership, you know, is going to be critical. But even then, you know, we did a lot of dog and pony show to clinicians to say, oh, here's what we're trying to do. Here's what you use the tool for. And so I, I think getting that buy-in from the leadership all the way down is critical. Um, the other point is, you know, try to leverage resources as much as you can and limit what IT has to do. I think if we had relied on our IT group to build all of this, it would never would have happened. So it was very helpful to say, here, we've built this. We have the number. All we need you to do is plug that number into the record. Um, that conversation um, went a lot easier than, say, we need to build this complex risk score or something like that. Of course, you have to actually have the resources to do that, but I, I think we found that that was a more productive way to go. So the other piece of advice is obviously have a big team and a lot of great people to help you. So I just wanted to close with highlighting the number of folks um, at Wake who have been involved in the various building the tool, particularly my collaborator, Kate Callahan, who's sort of been my uh, geriatrician partner in crime uh, in leading a lot of this work. So with that, I will uh, close. Thank you, Nick. Okay, so now uh, thank you all for the presentations and, and we have uh, questions coming up. I'm gonna start quickly with some of them. Uh, I guess this is one for the whole group from Brian Buda from Hopkins. Uh, can the panelists discuss the difference between claims-based frailty index versus EHR, electronic health record-based frailty index? Oh, uh, Andy, you are, you are muted, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I can kick off if you like. So, um, I mean, the other panelists might have more insight because I've used claims-based systems, but uh, I mean, my starting position would be that the claims-based FIs are probably more likely to have a greater proportion of disease-based variables. That would be my starting position because that's typically the way that claims-based systems work to some extent. Whereas our EFI, although it was, I mean, it still has a large proportion of diseases. It does extend over to the uh, other elements of, of typical frailty index, uh, disabilities, impairments, symptoms. That would be my thoughts on one of the key differences. I mean, the others might have views as well. I, I think I just have a practical thing. One of the barriers we've run into is um, not just the lag, but the availability of claims. At least at our institution, the, the data use agreements with which we have data on a more frequent basis basically say you can't use it for research. Um, and so we've always sort of shied away from using the claims, thinking that, well, we're going to want to do some research with this, um, because otherwise we've just been told from our you know, security office that we just can't use it in that way under the current contracts. And so that's always been a major roadblock for us. One of the things that we ran into was um, considerations of missing data. And Nick, to your point of not being able to run an EFI on patients who are just coming in for a referral or an emergency situation. So that's where claims can really be advantageous. It's not perfect, you know, when you augment your claims with things like labs um, and me durable medical equipment and, and other types of inputs, you certainly do better. But for a large population health uh, types of work and certainly the research that we're doing, that's how we settled on using claims instead of EHRs, extracted data only. There was there's a question specifically for Andrew. Uh, are, the, are the EFI assessed by GPs available to clinicians in case of a hospitalization? If yes, do hospital clinicians consider the electronic EFI during their management? Yeah. Um... Mainly not, I think is the correct answer. So it is theoretically possible to see EFI scores, but it relies on one, it being a general practice that uses only one of those four systems because only one of the four do they code the score 
the others typically record a, a frailty category. Um, you can theoretically see the score from that system in secondary care, um, but I think it's fair to say that it, it certainly isn't in routine use. It's not, not used in secondary care for that purpose. I mean, there are a small number of places that are starting to work along the lines um, that, that I suppose Nick and Ariella were describing. So starting to use it as part of the referral pathways for things like perioperative care, that's I suspect where things will go. Um, and that might happen uh, over the next few years as well, but at the minute, largely not. Largely not. Great. I, 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 there is a comment, a kind of a question uh, regarding Nick's presentation, just to highlight the point that, of course, many patients with frailty may prefer aggressive medical care instead of limitation of care. So we, we it, it, it goes to the issue of the deprescribing. You know, I don't know if you have an answer, Nick. Yeah, I, I think I, I should. I have a lot of conversations with my geriatrics colleagues and the term we prefer should be optimal prescribing, not necessarily that it's always deprescribing. So Dan's point is well taken that it's, it's about trying to optimize things and not necessarily always take meds away. Okay. I think that also gets to my point about not using frailty as you know, the new ageism, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want to just have a number that's in the chart that then leads to suboptimal care. So we have to be thoughtful about how we roll these types of EFIs out. Right. Another question for Andrew uh, is very specific about the English longitudinal study of aging attempted to link participants to their electronic fault index. Yeah, so ELSA does not, as I understand, currently have primary care data linkage. They've been planning to for some time, but last time I heard, I don't think they've got it yet. We do have it as part of a, a, a national cohort study that I lead that's smaller than ELSA, but we have primary care data linkage. We've got about 1,500 participants and are looking to expand it. But then actually also in um, UK Biobank, which is a huge um, national cohort study, that does have primary care linkage. So we are, we are actively doing some work to re-specify the EFI in Biobank. Great, and there was a question for Nick. Uh, do you consider supplementing your EHR data with outside claims data? I guess you kind of addressed it earlier, or other outside data sources to fill in the gaps. The, the one place where we are doing things, so there's a lot of these, um, what are they called, admission discharge transfer things that are in the transitional care space. So the, the particular product we have is a company called, a, a third party vendor called Patient Ping, um, that at least we've used to sort of fill in the gaps about utilization that's not tracked by us. Um, you don't get a granular level of detail, but you at least know if someone's hospitalized, there's an EED visit with some primary diagnosis codes. So that's the one thing we have used to try to fill in the gaps, although admittedly it's nowhere near as good as the claims. Great. There, uh, there was, a, I guess, a question that is a, a kind of technical, but I think you you all mentioned during your presentations in some way. Was there any difficulty with having discrete data pool into the EFI? I guess with Andy, but all all the other speakers probably have dealt with it. Yeah. Does that does that mean sort of sensitive data? Is that what that means? I guess the the questioner can probably clarify that because it's not. Is Dr. Cummins. I guess we'll wait for that. No, yeah. I can uh, sort of comment. I mean, one of the things, so we've built it primarily relying on structured data. And so one of the areas we want to go, there's been some um, great work out of Johns Hopkins about, you know, getting into the notes and natural language processing and showing how much more you pick up in terms of geriatric syndromes. And so one of our dreams is you have the structured data, you're putting it together to the notes and building something like that. But obviously that's a lot of work and we're nowhere near far along in doing that. Yeah, and I mean, it's same with us. We're, we don't use any NLP um, mm -hmm. processing at all. Um, and there's actually quite a lot of difficulties doing that in the UK using this sort of data. I mean, all the data is, is anonymized, obviously. So there's no way of re-identifying a person in any, any of the data sets that we use. I mean, that's a general principle that, that we would use. I'm going back. I would just add that at, at VA, not specific to the frailty index, but just generally in terms of um, health factors and other things that we are able to extract. We have used NLP for things like smoking um, and, and other types of variables that become very relevant, certainly when we think about risk factors for frailty. 
a lot of great questions. I'm trying to <laughs> give opportunities to other people. Some people are asking many questions that are great, but uh, actually I wanted to get a question from Dai Kim uh, that is well known to Ariel and, and, and the group. Uh, could you comment on the calibration of different frailty indices across hospitals or health systems? That is a very great, great question too. Anybody want to take that? Again, repeat. Um, no, okay. I was going to say not not really because then it starts to get me tangled up in concepts of calibration. Do you mean calibration in the statistical sense? I suppose would be my first question in terms of model validation. Um, I mean the the, the 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 simple thing to say is that although our EFI has good predictive validity uh, and pretty reasonable discrimination, the calibration estimates were quite low. Um, if that's what you're asking. Calibration across different hospitals or health systems. Um, do you, so the, I suppose the other element to that is linked to our primary care work. It's possible that different practices could record information in different, slightly different ways. One practice might be better uh, at recording data. We're actually updating our EFI to develop version two. And we're going to incorporate methods that actually take account, better account of how differences uh, in coding practices across different general practices in the UK work is, I suppose, the answer to that. That's, that's, what, what, let, let me try to get Dr. Kim to answer, ask a clarification, maybe I'll, if you, you are allowed to, to talk, Dr. Kim, if you have any anything, any clarify, clarifying question. Yeah, hi, uh, can you uh, hear me? Yes. Uh, well, thank you for this opportunity. I, I'm interested in uh, a frailty index value calculated from a particular health system, uh, let's say 0 0.2, does that mean the same amount of frailty and risk um, in, uh, you know, uh, according to a different frailty index uh, from a different hospital? So for example, like Ariella's VA FI 0 0.2 means the same 0 0.2 in uh, maybe Nick's uh, Wake Forest uh, EFI. I think I can take a stab and the answer is probably no. I mean, based what we've seen in the variability when you try to look at frailty prevalence right across research studies and things of that sort, I would expect that, yeah, a 0.2 in mine doesn't mean the same thing necessarily as a 0.2 in Ariella's, although I wouldn't expect them to be way off, right? But there might be some miscalibration there, I, I think for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. We've done a bit of work about that. We've looked at mapping equations between our EFI and research standard frailty indices. So I suppose that's how you could investigate it. But I suppose my thought would be the same as Nick. They're probably quite similar if it's a similar healthcare system and some similarities to the index, but they probably won't map perfectly. Okay, great questions. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for clarifying that. And thank you for all your, all your work in front indexes. I have a, an interesting question from Saori Harada from uh, Munich, Germany, if an electronic FI relies largely on data from outpatient care, I assume the number of severe threat is limited compared to that of non frail population because they are too frail to come to the outpatient care. If this is the case, how could we tackle this bias? Thank you. So I can take that one first. That's, uh, so our claims run the gamut, right? They're not just outpatient, they're all claims. Um, and so what's actually been fascinating, we, there's in the literature, we talk about 0.7 being that upper limit of frailty uh, for most people that's beyond that is not compatible with life. We have found in, in our cohort of about 3 million veterans that there were over 4,000 who had a score of 0.9. Now who exactly those people are and what exactly is going on, I don't know. But just to give you a sense that we're finding the very, very severely frail uh, veterans, at least using the, the system that we have. Okay, I think we're running out of time, but I'm gonna, I, I, there are very interesting questions. Another one for Brian Buddha from Hopkins. Uh, since you are incorporating not only codes compared to the other EFIs, but also other elements in your electronic frailty index, are your processing of clinical, the clinical notes or mainly retrieving values from a structured data? That's number one. I think that's another one, but go ahead. Yeah, I think it was, it's structured data for the most part, other than what Ariella mentioned about smoking and things like that. And I think an, an important question related, how large is your technical team managing and monitoring the EFI and what is the overall effort allocated for that? I guess that applies to everyone. 
Yeah, I suppose I can start in terms of technical thing. You're probably talking. Um, it's split across different people, but you're talk, probably talking about half an FTE of somebody to really manage like this. But this is with very experienced people who really know what they're doing with less. It would probably take more effort, um, but something in that ballpark half, maybe a full FTE of technical folks. I would say similar. It's uh, we've got quite a research team here, but what we're trying to do as we make our VAFI readily available is with that code creating what's called an R wrapper, so that ultimately you could just press a button and run the VAFI for any research study across VA. So it's it's coming. So we run out of time, and I really appreciate the, the great presentations. I thank again uh, Andrew Clegg, Ariel Orcavi, and Nick Pajowski for, for this panel. Uh, it was very illuminating. Still a lot of questions when answer, and answer. There was a, obviously a lot of interest, and, and I encourage our colleagues to think about writing a paper that will elaborate on these issues more in depth. I think it's a, an issue of uh, most interest to many people. So I just want to remind uh, the audience to please complete your evaluations and, and tell you about the next interesting presentation uh, for February. Uh, let me just get, give you the exact title. Uh, by Dr. Uh, Karen Bandin Rush from Johns Hopkins University. She'll be talking on February 9th on progression of physical frailty and the risk of all cause mortality. And thank you again for everybody for participating and for asking these questions. And thank you again for our speakers. Thank you.